You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. News, views, and interviews in association with FE News. Hello, I'm Tom Buick. Welcome to episode 35 of Skills World Live. And alas, our last show as we take a short break for the summer. Have no fear though, folks, we'll be back in the early autumn when the leaves turn a golden hue, connecting once again the world of FE. That's because we now know the coronavirus challenge will still be with us for some time to come. Throughout this past 11 weeks since we first went on air, Skills World Live has become a bit of a sector phenomenon. We had no idea that after just 35 episodes and 2100 minutes of live programming, 190 phone chat guests, that we'd attract so many thousands of listens, all available in glorious audio colour and in playback from one of your favourite podcasting sites. Stand by, ladies and gentlemen, in the week that saw the Chancellor's COVID-19 recovery jobs plan for our latest Rishi Dishi of informed guests and topical debate. Yep, seriously, the Metro newspaper described the Chancellor of the Exchequer's plans to give us all a meal voucher in August to support the hospitality trade as grab a Rishi Dishi. Not that I'm jealous, you understand, of this lean and handsome 40-year-old politician from Southampton, or indeed the way he seems to have been taken into the nation's affections, not least with his relatively smooth handling of the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression. At least so far, that is. But can the same be said about the great leader, who is based in Sanctuary Towers, Great Smith Street, London, SW1? I'm talking, of course, about the embattled Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson, accused by some opposition MPs this week as being asleep at the wheel during COVID-19. He came out fighting today, though, in a speech trailing this autumn's expected FE white paper. You know, the one the great leader had already called really revolutionary. In it, Williamson declared two new enemies of the people, the universities, for presiding over the third highest graduate underemployment rate in Europe, after only Ireland and the Czech Republic, and awarding bodies for developing, and I quote, a ridiculous number of qualifications. Given my day job, folks, it's clear that if I'm not back in this man cave of a studio when Skills World Live returns in September, it's because I've been sent to the gulag to learn about how to implement a German-style technical education system. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, is all about cool and calm reflections. Yep, we've covered a lot of topics on this show, from the Youth Unemployment Challenge to whether we've got the right skills to cope with the Fourth Industrial Revolution. From ministers to think tank bosses to sector leaders from across the UK and around the world, We've had our fair share of them all since we broadcast our inaugural live show during lockdown on April the 23rd. Even my editor, Gavin O'Mara, has visibly aged since the former editor, Kelly O'Mara, handed over the hot seat to him in May. That dynamic FE News duo have been simply inundated with requests to appear on the show. And joining me on tonight's programme is another cornucopia of guests from across the Civic intellectual and FE sector world. My special guest this evening is that well-known independent thinker, panellist on the BBC's Moral Maze and the director of the Academy of Ideas. Who else but Claire Fox, who just happens to be, by the way, a former FE lecturer. Stay tuned for the phone chat segments of the show. I'll be reflecting on what lessons we can learn from the coronavirus crisis with Sharon Blyfield, a senior manager in early careers at the multinational giant Coca-Cola. Joining us in that segment will be Elena Magrini from the Centre for Cities. And we also welcome a third-time guest appearance from the boss of the Higher Education Policy Institute, Nick Hillman. In the final segment of this uh, season finale, I'll be gathering an international flavour to our discussions as we talk to the head of the Global Apprenticeship Network based in Geneva, the Paris-based Open Classrooms Company and the Manchester-based award-winning global e-learning platform 
one file. But first, let's find out what's been making the news headlines in your skills world this week. Secretary of State Gavin Williamson has broadcast a speech earlier today saying that he is tearing up the symbolic target of 50% of young people going to English universities. Speaking for an event organised by the think tank the Social Market Foundation, Williamson said it was time to end the distinction that higher education meant better than further education when it came to the different paths people chose to land skilled and productive jobs. Admitting that the government had failed to invest sufficiently in FE over the past decade, he said that the white paper due in the autumn would fundamentally rebalance the sector towards a more German-style technical education model. In other news... Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, announced this week an initial £2 billion to protect jobs and apprenticeships as the country emerges emerges from the coronavirus. The plan for jobs includes a number of cash boosts to employers to hire new apprentices. A bonus of £3,000 is available to firms that take on apprentices aged between 16 and 18. Meanwhile, a new Kickstarter scheme is being launched next month offering a 24-year-old on universal credit a wage subsidy of £6,500 for every employer that takes one on. Sector leaders have broadly welcomed the move, although some concerns have been raised about the complexity of the measures and whether job support will be tied to quality and accredited training. The move comes as the youth unemployment rate has doubled to half a million since the crisis began in March. And finally... The Department for Education has said providers can welcome back priority adult and community learners from next week. The Association of Colleges, the Association of Employment and Learning Providers and HOLEX, the lead professional body, had joined forces to lobby the Secretary of State, Gavin Williamson, for a change in the DfE guidance allowing the safe return of learners over the age of 19. The positive news comes as Williamson also announced his expectation that all schools and colleges will be fully open from September. That's all your Skills World News from fenews.co.uk. Contact us at Skills World Live. Email skillsworld at fenews.co.uk. Follow us on Twitter at Tom Buick at FE News. Use the hashtag Skills World. Call us on 02032. 900 treble one that's 02032 900 treble one
That was Last Days of Summer by Bastian Slice. All the tunes you'll hear this evening, folks, are not only selected from that independent music site of choice, EpidemicSound.com, but I'm also dedicating each of the tracks played to a member of the Skills World Live production team, because it is our last show of the series after all. That tune was for the team's policy guru, Dr. Rebecca Conway, who sent me an email today saying that I should just play any song that was, and I quote, poppy and bouncy. It reminded me of a news article that appeared on the BBC website earlier, which was reporting on a scientific study about changing music tastes as a result of COVID-19. Apparently, before the crisis, the research team found evidence of what they called the slow banger, with more depressing lyrics, like those uh, songs sung by Adele and Ariana Grande with beats per minute, at a low 104 tempo. However, more recently, during the crisis, people have been downloading happier-sounding tracks with a poppier and bouncier 122 beats per minute. The population, it seems, just wants to get away from it all. Now, as you know, tonight's programme is a bit of a retrospective as we explore some of the themes and issues in Skills World and the effects of the pandemic in general on all of us. Joining me on the line to discuss the whole experience of lockdown and some of her reflections on the world of education and the growing cancel culture is my very special guest and the director of the Academy of Ideas, Claire Fox. Good evening, Claire. Hi, Tom. Have you been listening to all positive music since the lockdown began? Well, I I thought I was because I'm a news junkie, so I... I... (laughs) got so depressed that I started to listen to music instead of the news. Right. One of my favourite is Neil Young, and he got embroiled in a big uh, culture war with Donald Trump. Then I quite like country and western, and I quite like the Dixie Chicks, and they dropped the word Dixie because of the culture wars. So I thought I'd go for a bit of classical music, only to find it was dead white males and I was being uh, Eurocentric. So I'm basically going for a bit of silence at this point. Right, well, that's not going to meet the 122 beats per minute (laughs) test, though, is it? But uh, as they say, silence is golden. Now, look, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, so-called cancel culture. For the benefit of listeners who are perhaps unclear what is meant by all, all that, Tell us what it is and and also why, in your view, it's such a potentially dangerous development in the whole discourse around identity politics and free speech. It just seems such a shame that uh, the terrible and brutal uh, killing of uh, uh, one man in America, of George Floyd, which did bring a genuinely spontaneous outrage and discussion about racism very quickly turned into you can't say that culture and where people who didn't go along with a particularly prescriptive and narrow version of either events or of accepting things like white privilege or um, uh, uh, unconscious bias suddenly were were called out, as it were, particularly by social media and denounced as though they were some kind of heretic. And then we're finding that they were being reprimanded at work, losing their job, being shamed, uh, shown up and although there's been quite a big case in that a lot of listeners might be aware of where David Starkey did an interview and I think that yeah. that interview was one where I certainly when I watched it was very uncomfortable I thought he did use a lot of racist ideas mm. and so you can say well that's understandable but this is the, the the cancel culture is not even for that it's for people challenging whether uh, we should all sign up to the official Black Lives Matters movement, yeah. which I think is a, a, you know, we should be able to debate these things without having a McCarthy atmosphere sure. of censorship. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, clearly hate speech. I mean, there are laws in place in this country to uh, outlaw that effectively. I mean, in the States, it's slightly different because of their constitutional um, amendment. But do you think people really understand the difference between hate speech and, frankly, being unsavoury and offensive, which whilst, you know, it may not appeal to to yours or my moral sentiments and values, it's nevertheless in a free society, people are entitled to say it. It's it's very important that we cling on to that. And I don't even know that we're quite sure what hate speech is. We think we are, but that's quite a subjective term when I see what's dubbed hate speech by certain people. So I think what we've got to now, and I think this is important for anyone involved in education, is we want to create a climate in which we have academic freedom, of course, at universities, but also where we're encouraging young people to think for themselves, to ask questions, to be critical thinkers. And if you actually close down whole ranges of subjects that you're not allowed to interrogate or debate, you actually 
uh, demonize curiosity in a way and asking difficult questions, I don't see how we can proceed with the job of educating people. It seems a very dangerous path to be going down. Yeah, I mean, it's ironic, isn't it, that the so-called cancel culture concept seem to actually begin, certainly here in the UK, actually on our university campuses. I mean, do you think that's changing? Well, no, I think that I wrote a book a few years ago called I Find That Offensive, which yeah. looked at what was happening with young people on campus. And a lot of people said, oh, you know, it's just silly students. Don't worry about it. It's hardly going to take off. You know, some Oxford students want to pull down a statue of Cecil Rhodes. That's just a kind of student issue. But as I think we've seen in a very intensified period in the last few months, this has now seeped out into popular culture, into the broader yeah. society. So I, I think we can't write it off. I think it's a tragedy that it happens on academic campuses, but I now think it's a much bigger issue for us. In fact, uh, you know, identity politics, which tries to say that we are defined by the immutable characteristics that we have, you know, like skin colour or gender or what have it, whatever it is, you know, I say I am a woman and that means that, that defines who I am. I think yeah. these things are actually anti antithetical to education, which is about using knowledge and ideas to become a different person and not to and to be able to transcend our, 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 our identities in that way. So some of us have launched a campaign called Don't Divide Us because we're so worried about the way that, for example, ethnicity is being used in a very divisive fashion to say that you are defined by whether you're white or whether you're black mm. and we don't think that's very helpful and a lot of teachers and educators and parents have contacted us saying that actually a lot of material that's been sent out by schools and colleges at the moment yeah. is only playing a very narrow narrative and i think that's quite a dangerous educational response to this so what changes then would you want to see specifically then to the world of education the curriculum in terms of how we ensure that you know of course there does have to be a debate and you know, arguably one of the things actually that the black lives matters movement sort of concept has brought is it's enabled us to have this debate actually about structural inequality and racism in our uh, society now that's different from as you say signing up to all the aims and objectives of the BLM uh, movement and their website hashtag defunding the police and all the rest of it but what yes. would you but what would you want to see then from the point of view of you know the education curriculum how teachers can potentially take a lead themselves in trying to ensure that all sides of these different arguments and perspectives are explored and as you say you get back to what the original intent of education was which was to equip people to think for themselves well a, a good example would be the demand to decolonize the curriculum yeah. and, you know, to change history. Now, I, I think that you can always say, let's have a look at the history curriculum. Let's look at what literature we're speaking. These things aren't stuck in aspic. That's a very important discussion. Mm. And so it would be good if we had that as an open debate. But in fact, it has become a closed debate in which there's only one answer, as it were. So you get into a situation where great enlightenment thinkers, it's not just statues that are being pulled down, but mm. the, the, the people who are associated with liberation, with equality, with the fights for uh, a progressive education even, are now being called dead white men. They need to be cast away. And I think that's an anti-educational approach. Well, it is, so, isn't it? You know, I've, I've I, I would about, want yeah. us to talk about history sure. well, in the round. Yeah. Everything can't be, we teach everything is through the prism of racial yeah, thinking. Exactly. So, that I mean, just wrong. Yeah, so talking about dead white men, for example, I mean, I was fascinated by a documentary I was watching over the, uh, you know, the 4th of July independence uh, weekend celebrations, obviously more in America than here in Britain, although we did obviously have the pubs open and the lifting of the lockdown that was a cause <laughs> for celebration but you know as I watched this three-parter on George Washington I mean two things really struck me one is without a doubt you know here was a person originally part of the British army but then sort of rises up becomes part of the movement to liberate the 13 colonies uh, from the evil you know King George III from their uh, perspective but of course he was not only a founder and the first president of the United States he was also a slave owner and he seemed to have no qualms with the idea of keeping those slaves does that mean now that you know anyone that's looking at that whole history of the foundation of america and a white man in someone like george washington that his statue should be torn down because he was clearly like edward colston um you know into into slave ownership well actually there are de demands that washington is removed right <laughs> statues of and you have situations where lincoln is being given the same treatment in america now the, the point about these things is 
it is good to talk about history and to have a greater sense of history. I know that you're passionate about history. Yeah. There are parts of British history that are not taught. You know, I, I would like there to be more teaching of some of the great working class movements that gave yeah, us, indeed. you know, the, uh, uh, the franchise yeah, the and so on. And all the rest of it, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So there's nothing wrong with expanding that. But, you know, if you're a teacher, you have a very limited amount of time to get through thousands of years. Yeah. And you've got to decide what it is you prioritise. And all I'm saying is that it seems to me that some of these quite knee-jerk reactions to racialising how we view history don't add to our understanding of it in a complex way. Yeah. They don't give us more information, they give us less, because we're t only to see George Washington as a slave owner. That's it. Mm. You're mm. not to discuss anything else. Yeah. So that seems to me to be not helpful. What could be a progressive, interesting challenging moment of a curriculum uh, look, uh, you know review is becoming quite a politicized narrow and quite nasty and this is where the the, the, the cancel culture comes in yeah. you know teachers who are challenging this in the school are basically being told to keep quiet and and and, and effectively shut up because people are so frightened and fearful that if they're seen to go against what mm. is now a set narrative that, that they will be accused of racism or bigotry and that's an unhelpful situation to have got ourselves in yeah as you say i mean those culture wars no doubt will continue and it is unhelpful but let's just uh, see how that all plays out over the summer now look there was one final question i had for you which is more related actually to today's sort of big secretary of state gavin williamson's speech appears to be ending three decades of an establishment consensus started by Tony Blair of sending 50% of young people to university. I mean, if effectively, he announced today he was tearing that up. What do you think to that? I think, wow, I can't believe it, because I know on this programme, and, and something you've been uh, very interested in, a lot of us have been concerned, uh, talk about things being stuck in aspic, that the 50% target of everyone going to university has become, instead of that, great moment of liberation where anyone could have a chance of going to university has become rather unhelpful as a route to getting a job. Universities have been devalued by it. the 50% who don't go to universities have also not done well out of it. And so this expansion of universities has been something that a lot of us have tried to query over recent years. When we tried to, people have tried to say, oh, you don't want ordinary people to go to university, but nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, so I'm delighted that there's now a shake-up. I, I think that this is something we can welcome. I'm hoping that it will mean now that further education courses are given a boost. Yeah. And, you know, we've just come out of this terrible lockdown. We're facing, really, let's be honest, some kind of cataclysmic potential mm. economic problems we certainly have to challenge. But every young person now is some, in some ways in the same boat. Yeah. So I think it is an opportunity to take uh, qualifications, to take how we educate the young and really give it a thorough shake up. And I'm hoping that if you happen to not want to go to study academic subjects at a university, you'll now be treated equally respectfully and given the kind of education and training possibilities that are afforded you know, real honour, and it will help you uh, uh, on your way. So I'm quite excited, aren't you? I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that the sort of shibboleth of the 50% has gone, because it's always got to be, hasn't it, in a democratic, inclusive society, about what are you doing for the 100%. And the fact is, when people leave that 100,000 hours, or was it 10,000 hours of compulsory schooling, you know, there are lots of different paths to success. You know that, Claire, through your own background and career, and I certainly know that through mine but I thought it was interesting yeah. that Gavin Williamson you know I mean he highlighted this 34% of graduates presumably this is all pre-crisis as well but 34% of graduates are in non-graduate jobs it's pr uh, apparently the third worst underemployment rate uh, of graduates uh, next to Ireland and the Czech Republic I mean again is is there an opportunity here to, to again return to the idea that you don't have to have a university degree necessarily to get a job you can just have an apprenticeship you can have a skill you can acquire that skill yeah. in other ways than just necessarily going to the three-year full-time bachelor's honours degree route. I think that's absolutely right, because the truth is that I don't think there's any... sort. What is a graduate job? I think, yeah. you know, I, I, I think I might have said on the programme before, when I went to university, my, my father was really worried because he said, you'll never get a job because I was doing English literature, and he had a point. You know, I could have got a good job if I'd left school at 18 yeah. or even at 16. 
In other words, university was not meant to be a route to a job. Right. So what I think is, is that you go to university because you want, you know, to have higher knowledge and education and so on. But it shouldn't just be about jobs. And absolutely, what we've now done is said that, for example, nurses or the police or all of these people need degrees to get their jobs. But I don't think you need an academic degree in order to do those jobs. And that's not insulting those jobs. I think mm. you can have brilliant training. That means that you actually go straight into work, you get trained or you go to training courses. We shouldn't think that a degree is the pinnacle of success. It's success yeah. in a particular narrow field, but it shouldn't be a route to, to market or to the job market. I think that that devalues education at a higher level as well, because I do think you should be given a chance at university to just study for the sake of it. But actually, some people don't want to do that. They want to work, and that's great. Yeah. And they should be given the opportunities to to study and, and gain qualifications in a different routes. Yeah. It's ever, Claire, absolute pleasure to talk to you. You're not the director of the Academy of Ideas for nothing. Thanks for joining Skills World Live this evening. Thanks, Claire Tom. Fox. It's been a great, great series, by the way. Congratulations Cheers. on the programme, and I look forward to it starting back up again. I'm looking forward to the next academic year too. Thanks, Claire. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. Forget Your Name by The Spring Gang with Vincent Vega. That soulful track was selected by our very own digital producer, the person who has probably done the most to catapult the show's ratings through the roof with her brilliant social media campaigns. I'm talking, of course, about Ellie Hansen, who asked me to play that track and also give a big shout-out to her partner, Luke. 
to continue tonight's big debate and including looking back on some of the major FE and HE stories and issues. I'm delighted to be joined on the line by Sharon Blyfield, Senior Manager, Business Partner, People and Culture, responsible for Great Britain's apprenticeships and early careers at Coca-Cola. Good evening, Sharon. Good evening. And joining us in this phone chat uh, segment is uh, he's uh, third time returner to the get, uh, to, um, to the program, and that's Nick Hillman, director of the Higher Education Policy Institute. Evening, Nick. Uh, good evening. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us again. And finally, uh, an inaugural uh, um, visit to the show is uh, Elena Magrini, who's the senior analyst at the Centre for Cities. Good evening, Elena. Hello. Good evening. Thank you, all three of you, for joining Skills World Live on this season finale. We do appreciate it. Now, Sharon, let's come to you first. Um, how has the lockdown affected your apprenticeship programmes then at Coca-Cola? I think we've been quite fortunate that uh, based on the programmes that we deliver and all the, also the stages that people are at their programmes, they've been able to do a lot of their development virtually. I mean, they've been really operating in a whole new world. Yeah. So our existing apprentices, I mean, we had a number of them going through endpoint assessment quite literally as we went into lockdown. So they'd all really planned for face-to-face um, and then were told, no, it's going to be virtual and hope that technology would work for them. Right. They, it, it worked really, really well. Yes. And in actual fact, you know, the vast majority of them came out with distinction and merits in their wow. programmes. So, so as a mega maybe, brand, yeah. So as a mega yeah. brand then, like yours, had to sort of also innovate yeah, uh, in terms of technology then and apprenticeships. What kind of things have you been doing? Yeah. Yeah, no, we absolutely had to because we had to send a lot of the apprentices home. So again, right. they weren't even in our offices or at our sites to be able to undertake uh, their programmes. So they've also had to rely on, like most of us, their home broadband to make sure that that worked well for them. But they've gotten through it. And that's testament to just how passionate they have been about succeeding in their program as well. Yeah, all those merits and distinctions. Fantastic. Well done to them. Now, Nick, um, after the latest intervention from the Secretary of State today, um, your HE and university colleagues, I mean, some of them might be spitting blood, weren't they? Yes, I thought it was a little bit odd what the Secretary of State did today. I mean, I think we can probably all agree that further education has been underfunded and that um, the half of the population that don't go to higher education have had a raw deal. But to convey that message by kicking universities seemed to me a rather Mm. odd way to do it. I mean, it wins their headlines, of course, and it gets speeches about skills and FE onto the front pages of the newspapers, but it's just a bit unnecessary. Is that the Um, point here, then? He's he's kind of setting this up. I mean, is this really the killer point that he's essentially, I mean, you think back today, is he, I mean, as I said, actually, in my opening part of the show, and listen, I'm I'm not immune from this criticism either, because I said that the Secretary of State sort of defined two enemies of the people, you know, the universities and um, the awarding bodies today. I mean, is that how it felt to you when you listened to the speech as well? I mean, he was kind of setting it up as a, you know, the Department of Education against universities, but in favour of FE, the Department of Education in favour of its own qualifications like T-levels, but against the kind of qualifications that, you know, um, awarding bodies, many of whom are charities, uh, organise. I mean, it did sort of feel like that uh, sort of Maoist, uh, uh, you know, cultural revolution kind of view of the world, I thought, today. You still there? Was that yeah. for me again, Tom? Yeah, 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 it was, Nick. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, I... I, I agree. I mean, it, I, I just found it odd. And of course, most of the people who are arguing that fewer people should go to university have degrees themselves and have done rather well out of them. Mm. Um, and, and it seems rather odd. And, and, and the parts of the country where very few people go to university, uh, you know, they probably want a crack at it the same way as, as middle class families in richer parts of the country yeah. can have a crack at it. Now, of course, we need better further education. But, but I, I, I agree with you. I mean, cracking down on, you know, a part of the education system for which you have responsibility uh, in the middle of a recession when there aren't many jobs around mm. just just strikes me as a bit odd. And, and it strikes me as odd for a conservative politician to do because it was Ken Baker who set a 30% target for higher education participation. It was... Ken Clark, who converted the polytechnics to universities. It was 
George Osborne that removed the student numbers cap. Um, mm. So it seemed to me there was a really important political recalibration going on. Mm. And, and frankly, I'm not sure it's the right thing. Yeah, well, that's the thing about today. I mean, arguably, it's 30 years of a cross-party sort of consensus has uh, just gone up in smoke. Now, uh, Elena, um, your work is very focused on major cities. I mean, what does your research tell you about some of the key issues now then that need to, to be addressed as we try and uh, plan our way out of this terrible coronavirus crises? Looks like uh, Elena's uh, dropped off, unfortunately. Never mind. Um, Sharon, let's just come back to you then on this sort of theme of today's speech. I don't know whether you caught uh, Gavin Williamson's uh, speech, but um, you know, w- w- what's your sort of perspective on the whole 50% then and universities? I mean, it's, it's, it's a pity, isn't it, that it's been set up as a kind of them versus us debate as opposed to actually how do we as a country get the whole of the cohort, the 100%, well served with good quality technical education skills and indeed university degrees. Yeah, I think um, just around that, when when the targets were set, um, I think the apprenticeship world was a totally different place. It was an absolutely totally different place. Yeah. And and I know that we've really been, you know, striving for equality apprenticeships versus somebody going to university. So I guess I'm not overly concerned that the target's been uh, removed. I think right. it for me is more about giving choice, but the good quality choice, whether that be university or whether that be via the apprenticeship route. Um, you know, I'm a big advocate for apprenticeships, um, whether you do you know, a, a lower level entry apprenticeship or or a higher apprenticeship within that. I think it's about giving people opportunities. But I think what COVID has kind of highlighted is that although people may want to go to university, the opportunities coming out of it are now uh, less because you've got uh, a lot of young people who are doing an apprenticeship, a degree apprenticeship, and because they will have that work experience that's gone with it, yeah. they're much more marketable. I mean, my nephew has has just come out of university, and I know that he, um, you know, he's job hunting and everything, and it's not easy because you yeah. know who, who are you going to look at? You've got four years of uh, work experience and the qualification, or someone who's gone purely down the academic route. It becomes, I think, a much bigger challenge. So it's about having um, a balance, yeah. I think, for both opportunities. And, and on that balance, and actually, I think Secretary State also has used the term rebalancing. I mean, is there a, actually an opportunity for FE and HE in some of this, Sharon, in relation to degree level apprenticeships? I mean, you'll be very kind of familiar with that uh, development. You may even have uh, degree apprentices at Coca Cola. I mean, is that potentially where the future will go? It's not so much about cracking down on the numbers per se going to university. It's just that they'll probably be doing more work-based related degrees in some ways like they did in the old days under the polytechnics, things like sandwich degrees, than perhaps has happened of late. I mean, Sharon, just get your perspective on that first, then I'll come back to you, Nick, on that point. Yeah, I I absolutely think that if you can blend it with a um, work-based, work-based opportunities, that really does strengthen it. And I think potentially, I know that, you know, at university, you can do a year's placement. um, And that will also then, I guess, build that CV and that work experience to be able to come into the work environment. Mm. And maybe that's what needs to be looked at. But I think for me, there are certain certain um degrees that definitely you need to go to university and the theoretical is really really critical but there are other more vocational type degrees as i would call them that um people have access to now compared to what they had previously and for me that's probably the most important thing there's got to be something for everyone uh, within that yeah, indeed. Now, Nick, um, foundation degrees, these two year sort of associate bachelor type degrees, I mean, they've fallen from 80 odd thousand in the system to 30,000. So it, it demonstrates that, you know, the trend has been, if you like, going against this idea of um, part time modular, you know, more work based sort of degrees. I mean, would you accept that part of the challenge going forward, I mean, given that I know you are a strong advocate of FE, um, that it is about building those partnerships between FEHE across the whole tertiary education system and perhaps rather than talking about a rebalancing between one set of institutions to another it's probably a rebalancing maybe of a balance between full-time bachelor degrees and master's programs and these you know this idea of more uh, degree 
level apprenticeships. I mean, would you support that as a policy objective then? I think education systems that incorporate diversity and diverse yeah. routes tend to be really good. You know, they tend to match the fact that all of us as human beings want different things. And so, so yes, I, I, you know, I, one of the things that worries me about the debate today on the back of the Secretary of State speech is, is it assumes the conversation that there's only two, two worlds. There's a sort of FE skills apprenticeship route, and then there's a sort of academic full-time three-year degree route. And actually, life's much messier than that. It's much messier than that. Already, there are academic options in FE colleges, and there are vocational options in HE, and there's pathways between the two. Um, and, and that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, and I agree with uh, the thought behind your question, and, and, and the Secretary of State talks about this too, that we perhaps don't skill up enough people in this country to levels four and level five, mm. where the foundation degree is and where HMCs and HMDs are. Um, but I, I don't particularly think that people... Uh, I don't think we should be downgrading people who are currently on their way to do level six and even level seven courses so that they stop at the end of level four and level five. I think that we should be encouraging people who are currently stopping and maybe level twos or level threes okay. and getting them, you know, keep on going, keep on upwards so that, um, uh, you know, more and more people are raising their skills. That's what we need mm. in a post-Brexit high-tech economy. Uh, and that will, you know, that moves us closer to some of the other countries in the OECD data that manage to uh, uh, have good numbers of people at level uh, four and five, as well as good numbers of people at level six and seven. Yeah, I mean, it's what Philip Auger called in his review, which, of course, there's still no mention yet whether that will be fully implemented or not. But uh, anyway, the concept of the missing middle or level four and five, as it's also described, I mean, that's where when you do compare us to a lot of our international competitors, Nick, there is clearly, you know, I mean, we're way behind. So, What's your thoughts about how that gap then could be could be filled going forward, given that we know from all these employer surveys that that's often what they bemoan, you know, a lack of these intermediate yeah. level skills? Well, well, the interesting thing about the speech today was it was spun as an attack on universities and an yeah. attack on the 50% target. But if you actually look at what he said, um, Gavin Williamson said the government will respond to the auger review uh, uh, at some future date. He called for more flexibility. Um, and the most interesting stuff in the auger report, in my view, is exactly in that space, letting people do bite-sized courses, allowing people to get funding for modules rather than whole degrees, re-encouraging part-time study, making the level four and level five offer clearer. And as I say, if you actually delve under the skin of what was said today, it's actually better and more positive than yeah. uh, than I think will be implied in tomorrow's headlines. Indeed, but that is often the case with a lot of these big, so-called big speeches. Now, Sharon, final word to you then. Uh, I mean, you and I'm sure have been following over the last couple of days uh, some of the um, new initiatives that the Chancellor, yeah. Rishi Sunak, uh, has announced, which is all about trying to help businesses and individuals you know, recover from this lockdown, recover from furlough as well, because that scheme will be turned off in October. From your perspective and from a kind of employer perspective, has he done enough, do you think? Is he offering on enough? Pa- on paper, on paper, it, it, it seems enough. It absolutely seems enough. I think it's about the reality of business then being able to embrace what he's offered and whether or not, um, you know, it will work not just for business, but uh, in particular in terms of what he's looking at for young people. I have a a real concern and we are reflecting on on what he said about the fact that, you know, creating lots of opportunities and incentivising organisations to take a lot of young people and then no guarantee at the end of it. So is it, because I think at the start you quoted half a million, um, you know, youth unemployment of half a million. Yeah, I'm really worried that, you know, a lot of organisations look at the incentive and go, yes, we'll we'll take that and we'll take the incentive. And then at the end of it, we still have those half a million or however many it is that that, uh, go through the programme, go through the schemes, that are then put back into the marketplace. Indeed. No guarantee. Yes, they've got job this, they've got some work experience, but no guarantee of a job. That's my big concern for it. 
Well, that's why I wrote in a uh, blog for FE Week today that, uh, you know, as, as welcome as these schemes are, we can't, they can't be allowed to operate as a kind of gangplank to the uh, dole queue. You know, can, we can't allow a yeah. sort of revolving door. There's got to be more sustainability than that. Look, uh, fantastic segment. Apologies, obviously, to Elena Magrini. We seem to have lost uh, the line, the connection to her. But Sharon Blyfield, Senior Manager, responsible for apprenticeships and early careers at Coca-Cola. And Nick Hillman, uh, always great value when he comes on this show, Director, Higher Education Policy Institute. Thanks both for joining me this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good evening. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. Arguably one of our most played artists on this show from the Epidemic Catalogue, the Swedish tech housemeister, Thomas Skiedelberg. Now, she didn't submit her own track request to me by the deadline. Too busy, apparently. So, Karen Dawes, Head of Operations, if you're not too busy to tune into the show this evening, that positive, uplifting track was for you and the Dawes family down there in Dartford, Kent. To close the show with me this evening... It feels like a real privilege to be joined by friends and acquaintances alike. On the line in this four-way discussion is Susanna Lawson, CEO and co-founder at OneFile. Good evening, Susanna. Hi, evening, Tom. Great to have you on. Now, uh, Nazreen Mani, who's the head of um, the director of the Global Apprenticeship Network, is also joining us from Geneva. Good evening, Nazreen. Hello, Tom. How are you? Yeah, and well, thanks. Great to have you back on the show. And hopefully, I really hope this time our third guest has not dropped off the line, but Chris Kirk, uh, UK Director at Open Classrooms. Good evening to you too. Yeah, good evening, Tom. Great. Thanks for joining us and thanks for helping me 
close this season finale. I've got a whole summer off. Just imagine it. Now, um, Susanna, by definition, you run an online digital business. You might think it's immune from the pandemic, but presumably one files had to make some, you know, quite significant adjustments. Yeah, we have. It's been a really fascinating time. All of our customers, we've got over 700 training providers, FE colleges, universities and employers that use OneFile. And they've had to pivot their delivery really, really quickly to get the full delivery online. So we've had to support them. We've had to put extra webinars on. They're using features that they didn't, um, they wouldn't normally have necessarily uh, used as quickly um, we've put on reimagining um, apprenticeship delivery post covid and we've just uh, spoken this week to interserve total people mysco college and extra college about the amazing work that they've done pivoting their delivery to go online and how one has been instrumental on that um, and what they're finding is the the online provisions that they've been f- sort of forced to put into place now and accelerate that. They've always been very innovative, but they've need, had to accelerate sort of three, six months, maybe 12 months to two years quicker than they were planning to. Yeah. But what they're seeing now is they can deliver those apprenticeships far more efficiently and p- profitably in the future, which is absolutely fantastic. So they're looking at lessons they've learned during the last three to four months and moving forward with that in the future. Yeah. I mean, obviously, nobody wish a pandemic like this on on anyone on any one country either but do you think you know one of the potential positives out of this is that that whole digital tipping point Susanna will come much sooner and has arguably happened already uh, whereas if we'd kind of carried on perhaps without the pandemic you know certainly Zoom and all these other things that now people just use in their everyday working lives would not have happened what do you think? Yeah, I definitely think that. Like I've said, we're speaking to businesses whose digital strategies have been fast forwarded by at least two years, which is phenomenal. Um, yeah. I mean, even ourselves, we were just getting into teams really um, prior to the pandemic. But obviously now it's been an absolute lifesaver during this time. And we're looking at setting up office uh, like the meeting rooms within our um, offices space as team office rooms. Yeah, right. So basically yeah. you, can, you can book it as a team's room. And then when you go in, your laptop syncs and everybody, the people working from home can then just automatically log in and you're mm. all in one place. Yeah. Um, I just think the, you know, the, the way that people work is going to change forever. The sort of, you know, mm. five days a week, eight hours a day in the office is, is definitely not going to be the way forward for the majority of businesses. Absolutely. I think the fourth industrial revolution, it's happened. It's happening. Nazreen, it's, it is. It, it's great to have you back on the show. Now, when we last spoke, we talked about some of the things other countries have been doing to support apprentices during the pandemic. What's your reflections then on uh, what the British Chancellor uh, of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, uh, appears now prepared to do. I mean, he's offering billions of pounds to employers to take on apprentices, particularly mm-hmm. younger apprentices. Well, I, I think the, the one thing that we must say first is congratulate leaders on taking a stand. Um, I think we, we're seeing many countries stepping up. Um, the the uh, Chancellor, in fact, probably the boldest move so far yeah. uh, across the world. But I do think the, the reality is young people have been disproportionately affected and we have to have some very directed solutions for them. And in fact, Gan is, is hosting uh, a large webinar next Friday, the 17th, mm. with really high-profile speakers, the OECD, the ILO, business leaders, the International Organization of Employers, to speak about that. What are the solutions for young people and what are the innovations? Because it yeah. can't be business as usual. Um, and I think the whole idea of a new normal has to go out the window. It, it has to be something completely different. Mm. Um, and we're seeing across the world, companies and countries being very responsive. And I'm amazed at how quickly policies are coming into play and being implemented even faster. Um, And I think if we can keep that political will and trajectory going, then we can start addressing uh, the massive fallout. I'm very disappointed when I see that, you know, our development goals and development agenda um, has been set back at least a decade. You know, we shouldn't be in 2020 still talking about issues of poverty and gender and and young people still being marginalized. But, But here we are. Yeah, indeed. And in all of this, I think Dan is trying to work with our partners to find solutions. Yeah, well, as you say, there's that whole sort of debate going on at the multilateral level, as well as obviously these uh, mm-hmm. more uh, national sort of domestic uh, debates uh, being led by our own Chancellor Sheikh like Rishi Sunak. Chris, yeah. tell us more about your company, Open Classrooms, and, and, and also what's happening in France. I mean, you're both a Paris and sort of London based company, but I hear that President Macron's also doing some big things around apprenticeships. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, Open Classrooms is a yeah a French uh, a higher education institution, fully online, um, and we kind of deliver to directly to students and education to employment platform, providing kind of uh, career transitions into tech jobs. We deliver apprenticeships, um, and the French system is not too dissimilar to that in England in terms of a levy, yeah. um, you know, quite high volumes, um, very similar in, t- in terms of, of quality, but they are very much always focused apprenticeships on new jobs um, right. and for younger people. Yeah. Um, so what they've been very keen to do because, you know, um, there has been less recruitment. So one of the changes they've made, and it, it probably wouldn't go down too well in, in the UK when we maybe think to some of the quality issues we had in apprenticeships a few years ago is allowing people to start their training when they're not in a job. Yeah, so, so programme apprenticeships fun. then. So they're kind yeah, of still so at school, still at college, yeah. Uh, well, no, well, so it could be with the training provider. So right. they, they yeah. get the, basically the first six months of the apprenticeship funded um, to develop their training, and then it's the training provider uh, responsibility to then find them that job within the six months so they can continue continue their training um, to go through because they're they're realistic that the incentives will and there are some incentives to obviously take apprentices on um, but they're also aware that they just aren't going to be the volume of jobs that existed pre-crisis and you know this can be a good interim measure for that six months to ensure that then someone can go on to complete um, their apprenticeship to go through but I mean France you know comes from a much stronger system of funding we're talking maybe three to four times the amount that probably spent um, in the UK so they they probably had a little bit more resilience built into the system and they've been able to switch some of that funding because it already existed to support the unemployed so funding people who have been made redundant in this time period onto associate uh, bachelor's and master's level sort of competency based based programs right. and, and one of the, the the nice things they're having in france is a almost like an individual learning account which allows people yeah, to I'm a fan of those. Sub, yeah yeah um get 500 euros a year uh, as their employment um yeah. and that allows them to really drive the choice of what training they want to help their career move forward so they've got yeah. there's a bit more chan- choice in france for for individuals in right. these times of crisis <laughs> Well, look, alas, we're running against the clock here, but just sort of 20 mm-hmm. seconds each, uh, just on this sort of last uh, thought. I mean, you know, when you look ahead, uh, obviously the challenge is around sort of youth um, employment, unemployment. I mean, it, is there anything you take out of some of the announcements that have been made either in this country or overseas that makes you think we can avoid this so-called lost coronavirus generation? 20 seconds to you first, Susanna. Oh, I, I think it's, it is a very tricky, obviously complex subject. Um, I think, yeah, the focus on the 16 to 24 year olds is essential, yeah. um, giving them as much exposure in the workplace as possible because they are going to be up against um, experienced people being made redundant, uh, looking for yeah. the same kind of roles. So, yeah, as much work experience as they can right. uh, with employers that have a serious work, work experience program. Absolutely. OK, Nazreen, all about rebalancing towards young people then with the apprenticeship program certainly in England. Well, I, I think the focus on work-based learning is really the way to go. Um, you know, it's putting people and training at the centre of this economic recovery. Um, and I think it also lends itself to really re-establishing the social contract um, where it's people-centred, it's focusing on skills development, it's giving people inclusive approaches and giving them a sustainable approach to skills development where we can develop adaptable skills, people can move into different roles going forward and really empowering us as we move through and beyond COVID. Okay, Chris, final 20 seconds to you then, my friend. Yeah, I just just think it's really positive that, you know, finally the Chancellor is putting his sort of money where his mouth is and and filling a gap that I think has been long been missing in terms of um, the vocational sector apprenticeships and and, and young people. So it's great to see that we're, we're finally moving in the right direction. It's about time. Okay, Chris Kirk, Nazreen Manny and Susanna Lawson. Thanks for joining the season finale of Skills World Live. Great to speak to you. Thank you. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. There we have it, folks. Another 60 glorious minutes of informed chat and topical debate as we've literally connected the world of FE. All thanks to the sponsorship and support of the Federation of Awarding Bodies Platinum Partners Programme. And huge thanks, of course, to all our guests across all 35 episodes. Enjoy the rest of your summer, because like good old Arnie Schwarzenegger once said, I'll be back. 
early September to be precise, so look out folks for the Skills World Live promos on your autumn academic year return. Don't forget, you can still listen in playback to all 71 episodes of my Skills World podcast. Just subscribe at any one of your favourite podcasting sites. Playing out now with this rather jazzy experimental track, Urban Conspiracy by Jules Geyer, selected by the editor himself, Gavin O'Mara. It's farewell from him, and it's Auf Wiedersehen from me. Goodbye. Listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. News, views, and interviews in association with FE News.